Okay, Anita, thank you so much for uh, joining me uh, and talking about the chapter um, in the Sick of the System book. So the first question is very, very simple. Why, why did you write the chapter? What's, uh, what, what's, what's in it? And what, what, do, what should we know about the chapter? Thanks for asking, Mike. Um, yeah, I think why writing at that time, um, that, that particular chapter was basically, I'm in swimming in this new sort of novelty that everyone else is in. Um, I've been trained to think about environment and culture, and I'm seeing these moments and just like everyone else trying to do something to, sure. to process. Yeah. So what do I turn to as my kind of wayfinder and that is metaphors. I, I study metaphors and how they relate to environment, how we compose worlds either um, mm -hmm. with the non-human world or other humans. So yeah, the, this is my, my toolkit for attending to the world. I think everyone was trying to attend in different ways and this is how I've been trained as a cultural and environmental theorist and activist. And what, what did you want to comment about the pandemic or the COVID or the emergency or the health crisis? Was, was there something that you thought, oh, I need to comment on this? Yeah, I think the, the fact of the metaphor, that's the main um, point that I want to say is that metaphors matter. Mm -hmm. um, metaphors matter, especially in times of what we think is novelty. I mean, we can argue this uh -huh. isn't exactly novelty because mm -hmm. there have been analogs um, and some of the crises that are built into it are not novel but um, especially in moments of emergence metaphors do this work of mediating uh, for us the, so we we grasp for something to make sense for us so the one that i most attend to in this chapter is of course the war metaphor yes. um, the the war against uh, against covid and um, of course we have to attend to what that brings along with us so my point is that we need metaphors, basically, that we, sh we shouldn't not, not use them. But people think that metaphors are just simply frills or literary devices. Mm -hmm. But my research looks at how metaphor actually composes worlds. So when we're using mm -hmm. a war metaphor, we need to look at the pros and the cons. The pros being, of course, that uh, we can mobilize quickly to do something. That's what wartime initiates. But then we also have this sort of slippage around enemies. Um, who's going to be, who are going to be the people on the front lines? Um, and as I wrote about in the article, you know, people who are, are described as being on the front lines didn't necessarily sure. sign up for the war. <laughs> and the people who are the casualties um, well, certainly didn't, didn't sign up for that. Um, and the people who are, for example, perceived as enemies um, as in um, Asian apprehended people who mm -hmm. are yes. now seen as carriers of this. Um, there's a whole fleet of things that get carried along in this metaphor that I think we have to be critically attentive to. Thank you. That's very clarifying. Um, so what, if I just finish reading the chapter, what do you think would be the biggest takeaway? What would be the thing that I... I walked away from that you wanted the reader to get what was what was the mm -hmm. what was the one thing you wanted the reader to get out of it yeah i guess the big thing is metaphors matter mm, okay. um, that's the, the one thing that i would suggest that we attend to them and i suppose under that there's three other things within metaphors matter um one is that we need them as i just mentioned Yes. There, we need them in these moments. Without so, them, there would be no sense of the world. There's no sense of the world without metaphors. We, we use them as wayfinders. Um, the second point, of course, is that we need to critically attend to them. Like, so uh, as I mentioned, what slips along, a metaphor carries over a bunch of things. That's the, the metaphor means carry over. So mm -hmm. what is being carried over in that war metaphor that is doing harm, <laughs> that we think mm -hmm. is, is in a caring way, but is doing harm, to people who are not deserving of, of the care because they're, they're seen as enemy combatants carrying the virus. Okay, so that's the second thing. And the third thing um, within the metaphors matter is that as we're focusing on one crisis, attending to the COVID thing, we must not forget about other 
so-called crises mm -hmm. or, or sure. issues that we're facing. So my, my work is in the cultural politics of climate change. So yeah, so I'm trying to think about how we can connect. So um, do you think, and this is, uh, I, I don't think you, you touch upon it, so that maybe this is good to expand on. So do you think certain metaphors that are, we are using, like war metaphors, or I, I know in the chapter you also mentioned a care mongering, mm -hmm. um, uh, do these metaphors also in some respects hide or suppress or obscure things that would be, should be revealed, I guess, is that, so in that sense, as you suggested, metaphors make things transparent or legible. So are they also making other things illegible and obscuring certain, Absolutely. if you will, because, acts? Yeah. Yeah. Because we know in war times, uh, for example, the war is the thing that everyone's going to attend to. Yeah. So if we say that the war against COVID is the mode of acting in the world now, then mm -hmm. You know, when I was first looking at this, there was there was the appeal to multiple governments to bail out uh, sure. fossil fuel industries. So yes. looking at the bailing out part. So in, in for example, care monitoring or caring for, we know that, uh, that governments have cared for people who have lost jobs. Yes. They've cared for whole sectors. So when we're thinking about caring and bailing out, mm -hmm. do we want to let go of climate change and bail out yeah. um, fossil fuels? And I think that is the case. You're right. I think the 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 language of caring for workers in the oil and gas industry has, in fact, paved over the environmental question, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it's almost like saying, "Yes, we know the environment is dying, but let's put that question on hold because people need jobs, right?" So we we kind of avoid that question. Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, is there uh, something that you would add to it now? Because you wrote this, it's funny to say a few months ago, it seems like mm. many, but as you suggested in your article, you, you know, the, at that time when you're writing it, New York was just becoming an issue. Now, now it has diminished. Um, is there something that you would add to it now that, that you didn't think of then or was not visible then? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate that question because I think that's what we lose in the moments of and go respond quickly. But that you know, cultural commentators are always in those moments, and we don't know. We it, it, hindsight isn't always, as the article says, <laughs> the 2020 thing. Um, yeah. I'm riffing off of that or that um, metaphor as well in the the article that 2020 is supposed to be this thing, and and it oh, doesn't yeah. ever give us perfect vision. Um, so, yeah, the, the thing that you mentioned, of course, New York, um, the whole rest of the states um, has been in a bit of a, a strange plight. So I would probably have attended to partisan politics a little bit more, how oh, something like yes. freedoms, you know, maybe less about New York and, and looking at the, the metaphors around individual liberties and what they're doing, um, you know, the, the, the notion of libertarian kind of... sure. Concerns to, to wear versus, a mask is to limit yeah. the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the metaphors around masks are really quite interesting. Um, so yeah, I might have attended to that. The other thing I did mention climate change um, at the beginning when I was writing that concern about oil bailouts, we didn't know that oil was also going to tank to the extent that it did. So some of those politics around bailing out, for example, Alberta in a particular way. Sure. Um, those, thankfully, there's a bit more opening to think about economic diversification in places like Alberta. Um, so that's that's been a bit of a relief that uh, that the coupling of the tanking of oil and you know this this has come at a at a good time to to actually conceive of getting off of fossil fuels. Um, and of course, the last thing that I I would ha would engage with now is the the um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Sure. Um, so that wasn't at all visible. So you mm -hmm. talked about what was visible and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, that the very disproportionate, we were just starting to get the statistics about how maybe a couple of weeks after I wrote how COVID was impacting racialized yes. populations differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's really come up um, as something that is equally important. Um, in this whole crisis to see who 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 matters who um who matters 
you know, in a spectacular way. Of course, that came up with the um, everyone's apt um, their attention to this this George Floyd um, murder, which was really spectacularized for mm -hmm. a captive audience <laughs> at the global pandemic, but less so in these mundane, everyday, um, you know, dehumanizations that happen for lack of care for racialized populations. So I think that's something that I would attend to a little bit more, like caremongering. I think that that one I would riff off a bit more as a metaphor. Yeah. Who do we care for and how is it built into our systems? Yeah, it is interesting actually now that you're saying that, it's also making me think about the whole question of of race and racialization because I'm thinking about the environmental question and, and the pipelines and the, and the great focus on pipelines and pipeline protests and indigenous sovereignty before the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. And then that was largely obscured. Absolutely. And yeah. although now we have this image of a knee on George Floyd's neck and the, the highly racialized numbers of deaths and, and the, the illness in, is especially south of the border in the United States of people who are black or Latino, we, that really hasn't translated so much to the Canadian debate around mm -hmm. resource extraction, indigenous sovereignty, people of color in Canada being racialized and maybe disadvantaged uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the context of of oil and gas um, industry, right? And, and there, there's a focus on the defunding the police, and we know that their um, uh, racialized people are are targeted and arrested at higher levels than um, than the average population. But but we haven't. It, it seems like that 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 conversation hasn't hasn't connected with the mm. environmental question. Absolutely, yeah. And as I write briefly in the article about the Wet'suwet'en um, opposition to mm -hmm the coastal gas, gas link project that is basically a camp of people in close proximity going to a community um, yes. during a time of pandemic. So yeah, that, that reminder from many indigenous communities that this is not our pandemic or um, that yeah. there are been others in history where people have invaded spaces with um, carrying things that they didn't know would kill people. Um, mm -hmm. But here we have an opportunity to actually say that this is possible. We know that this, this stuff is, yeah. So all of these things you're right, have, that's been obscured. There was a very active political scene right before this hit in Canada mm -hmm. around, um, you know, I would say it's extension of Idle No More, um, where yes. people were really connecting, communities were connecting yeah. all across Turtle Island or Canada to mm -hmm. sort of oppose this kind of business as usual getting into places. So yeah, that you're right, that has been obscured with the more spectacular version. Well, that's, that's great, Anita. Thank you so much. That really, I think, illuminates a lot of what you've written and, and, and certainly humanizes things as well um, in this moment of COVID where we can only talk like this from screen to screen <laughs> so thank, thank you so much thank you for the much. opportunity mike i okay. appreciate your interest in it okay all right thank you thank you